Aloha, this is Pastor Perry, and I want to thank you for joining us to study the Word of God together. We pray that you will be blessed as the Holy Spirit ministers to you through this message and through God's Word. Today's scripture reading is from Ephesians 6, 12, and 13. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God, that you may be able to resist the evil day, and having done everything, to stand firm. This is the word of the Lord. Josh, thanks for doing our reading today. Would you pray with me as we look into God's word together? Lord, you tell us that you want us to stand firm, that you want us to be prepared for the battle, that you want us to be dressed properly in order to encounter the schemes of the evil one. Lord, we thank you that you've given us your word to learn from, to depend on, and to apply to our lives. We pray, Lord, now as we look into your word, that it would be the Holy Spirit who is our teacher who speaks through me, your words, that we might understand better this passage of Scripture that we're looking at today about the spiritual warfare and the spiritual armor that you've called us to put on. Lord, may our hearing these words and heeding these words make a difference in our lives and the lives of those around us. Lord, speak to us now, we ask, through Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Something that you might not know about me is that I used to be part of a motorcycle gang. Not really. (laughs) Um, Well, not one of those bar-hopping, mischievous-causing, Harley-Davidson-riding motorcycle gangs, but a group of, of, of friendly and enthusiastic dirt bike riders where we rode specially designed dirt bikes in the trails and the dirt. And every Saturday, we'd go up to Kahuku. There's a track up there along with a bunch of trails at the Kahuku motorcycle track. And we'd ride these miles of trails and going, dodging boulders and over roots and down valleys and up mountains and dodging trees and all kinds of things. It was just a, a lot of fun. And our ritual include every Saturday when we got there that we'd put on all kinds of protective armor to protect ourselves from any kind of injury. And then after we got all suited up, we'd gather together in a circle and we'd pray for the Lord to guide us and to protect us. And that was our ritual. And that ritual of putting on protective gear and then praying is a summary of what we're going to look at today in Ephesians chapter 6. In Ephesians 6, we're told that we're in a spiritual warfare and we need to come prepared and we put on the armor, but it's not enough just to put the armor on. You then need to pray once you put that armor on. Both protection and prayer are, are necessary. And dirt bike riding is a really body-bruising, bone-breaking sport. I was reflecting on our, our team, that the yeah, gang that used to ride, and let's see, we had broken ankles, and we had broken wrists, and we had broken ribs, and we had some broken legs, and, you know, less common was the broken sternum and the blown-out elbow and the blown-out shoulder. And needless to say, dirt bike riding is a lot of fun. <laughs> And to be prepared so we wouldn't get all these broken things or to minimize it, we put in all this gear and we'd have shin guards that actually had knee braces on them. And depending on how valuable you thought your knees were, you'd spend more and more money on these things. And you could spend $500 to $1,000 just on knee braces so you wouldn't tweak your knee. And we had padded pants and we had calf length boots, you know, to protect our ankles and our legs. And we had chest and back protectors and, and kidney belts and gloves and goggles, of course, full face helmets. And we wore all this, of course, to protect ourselves. And when you put these things on, you had to put them on in a particular order. Well, one time, I was all done getting suited up, and everybody's ready to ride, and I got my helmet on, goggles, and gloves, when I realized I haven't put my shin guard slash knee braces on. And that's kind of a big deal, because they're supposed to go on first. So I had to take my gloves off, my goggles off, 
my helmet off, my chest protector off, my kidney belt off, my boots off, and then I take my pants off because they go underneath the pants. You know, and this, by this time, all the other riders are going, really, Perry? And I'm like putting my knee braces on, the pants back on, and put everything back on. But the order was significant. Well, as we come to the list of the armor that we're to put on for the spiritual battle, the spiritual armor, Paul lists the armor in a particular order. And we have to ask ourselves, is there a significance to the order that he gives us? Follow along as I, I read from verses 14 to 17 of Ephesians 6 with you thinking about the order of the armor as I read it. Starting in verse 14, he says, Stand firm, therefore having girded your loins with truth. That's what we call the belt of truth, girding your loins, wearing this belt. And he starts with that first. And then he says, having put on the breastplate of righteousness. And then he says in verse 15, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And then he says, in addition, taking up the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming missiles of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And so he gives us this list and Clearly, Paul is referring to the armor that a Roman soldier in the first century would be wearing as he lists this armor. And you might recall that the Apostle Paul has been arrested for preaching Christ. He is in Rome, the capital of the empire. He is in his own rented quarters under house arrest, and he is chained to a Roman guard 24-7. So some people would suggest that the Apostle Paul, while writing this letter, is looking at this Roman soldier and looking at every piece of his armor and his writing and trying to relate it to our spiritual lives. But when you think about it, it's doubtful that a Roman soldier would be dressed in full battle gear in a home to watch over the Apostle Paul, who's this kind of now frail, older, bruised, broken man. I don't think you really need a shield from him and a chest protector, and I don't think they really wore their helmet. So Paul, though referring to this armor, is probably thinking from his memory from what he's seen rather than describing an actual soldier that he is chained to. Well, some suggest that the order he gives is the order that this Roman soldier would, would put the armor on. But when you read it, some of it looks like, well, I, I, I think he'd put his boots on, you know, earlier than it's listed here. And, and I'm not sure if this is the order. So then some people suggest, well, maybe this is the order that the Christian should put their armor on. I don't know. Maybe the order is somewhat insignificant. But we would like to talk to the first one, and I think the first one should be first, and that's significant. <laughs> so if you take out your outlines, we're going to talk about the belt of truth, number one. And if you don't have an outline, you're watching online, they're available on our website, or if you're in the room, we have some by the doors, you're always welcome to jump up and get one. But let's talk about this belt of truth. He's talking about girding your loins. And it would make sense that the Roman soldier would put this belt on rather early on because on his belt, he has the scabbard for his sword and the breastplate that he puts on is hooked to the belt. And he uses the belt to cinch up his long robe so he could run and fight battles. So he'd put it on fairly early. I don't know if he'd put it on first, but as a Christian, I think this is a good thing to put on first, that you must start with the truth. In fact, without starting with the truth in your life, you can't really be a real Christian. Real Christianity, which is the theme of this series on the book of Ephesians, is based on the truth. So how do you actually put on this belt of truth? I mean, it's a metaphor, of course. It's not a physical thing. So what does he mean by this belt of truth? And, and how do you put it on? And, and in the words of Pontius Pilate, what is truth? When you think about it, truth is the foundation of everything in your life. It needs to be the foundation of every relationship you have. You, you want the truth in that relationship, that that person is who they say they are in that relationship. <laughs> truth needs to be the foundation of every philosophy that you hold. It needs to be the foundation of, of true religion, of true Christianity. It needs to be the foundation of your surgery that's pending. You want that based on the truth. 
A cocky graduate student approached his religion professor and said, I don't believe in absolute truth. I believe that you have your truth and I have my truth. There is no absolute truth. And that wise professor just looked at him and said, are you absolutely sure? (laughs) Think about that for a moment. It's self-contradicting to say there's absolutely no absolute truth. So what is truth? Well, we go to the Scriptures to find out, and we discover that truth is a person. Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 14. It tells us this, John 1, 14. And the Word, which is another name for Jesus, became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father. And notice what it says. He's full of grace and what? Truth. Truth is a person, the Lord Jesus. The Lord Jesus makes this clear in John chapter 14. In John chapter 14, part of verse 6 says this. Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. Jesus says, I am truth. Truth is a person. You can't know truth fully without knowing Jesus Christ. He is the truth. By that we mean he is the source of truth. All truth is God's truth. He is the source of it. And anything contrary to what Jesus says is a lie. Anything contrary to what Jesus believes is a lie. And all lies are from the pit of hell, from the father of lies, the devil himself. Notice what Jesus says in John chapter 8, verse 44. In John 8, 44, speaking of the devil, he says, the devil is a liar and the father of lies. It's pretty simple. Jesus is the source of truth. The devil is the source of lies. And those are the only two things you have to base your life on, your thoughts on, your philosophy on, truth or lies, and Jesus is a source of truth. So when you deny truth or deny that there is an absolute truth, you're denying Jesus Christ. And that's why we have this nonsense going on now when people go, there's no such thing as absolute truth, and you have your truth. That is a lie from the pit of hell. That is the devil trying to get rid of Jesus. So when we talk about the belt of truth, we can't talk about the belt of truth without talking about Jesus himself. So what is this belt of truth? Well, we have no definition given in the Scripture, but if you read all the Scriptures, we get an idea, and here's how I've put it in your notes. What is it? It is to believe and to act like Jesus to believe and to act like Jesus. When it comes to putting on the spiritual armor, you must start with Jesus. Your faith has to be built on Jesus. Jesus is the foundation, the Apostle Paul tells us. And we need to believe in who he is and what he says, and we must act accordingly. An ancient Chinese proverb that you've probably heard says that a journey of a thousand miles begins with the first step. But if that first step is in the wrong direction, you're going to end up in the wrong place. You have to start with the truth. You have to start headed in the right direction with the very first step. And so that's why when we have this armor, I think this is a good one to start with because you have to start with the truth. If you don't start with the truth, you don't know what any of the other armor really is. On my recent trip to Greece, I was visiting a a home that I'd never been to before for a Bible study that I was leading, and my friend Bev was driving. I was a passenger, and we we went there, and it was in a section of Athens we'd never been to before. And and when we got ready to leave, she said, well, I'm not really sure how to get home from here because we came in on these series of one-way streets, and you have to go a certain way. So she grabbed her phone, and she got the Google Maps, and the little voice said, and we haven't even pulled out of the parking uh, where we park yet from the house, it said, head northwest. Do you find that helpful? (laughs) 
I didn't. But so she hands me the phone to look at it, and she hands it to me. And as soon as she hands it to me, the phone says, head southeast. She grabbed the phone from me, started laughing, and then said, you can't touch my phone. (laughs) We didn't know whether to go northwest or to go southeast. And the first step of our direction is sort of essential. You got to start with the truth. And Jesus tells us, if you want to end up in my father's house someday, you have to start in the right direction with the first step. You have to start with Jesus. Perhaps you've heard of the controversy, recent controversy, of Pope Francis. Pope Francis, the leader of the Catholic Church, and what he said at a multi-faith gathering of children earlier this month in Singapore. And what he said is not just controversial to me as a Protestant, but it's controversial to the very Catholic Church, and Catholics are speaking up against what their Pope has said. I want to quote to you what he said, but it's a translation into the English, because he didn't speak it in English, but here is a quote. Pope Francis, a couple weeks ago, said this. All religions are paths to reach God. They are to make a comparison like different languages, different dialects to get there. But God is God for everyone. If you start a fight saying, my religion is more important than yours, mine is true and yours isn't, where will that lead us? The Pope goes on to say, there is only one God, and each of us has a language to arrive at God. Some are Sikh, Muslim, Hindus, Christians. They are different ways to God. That is what Pope Francis said and believes. And if you believe that, You have believed a lie from the pit of hell spoken by the devil himself. Contrast that with what the scriptures say, which Jesus himself said in John 14, 6. Now that we read the whole verse, John 14, 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way. Notice the word the, not a way, not one of many. I am the way, the truth. And the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. If you want to get to my Father's house, you have to take the right path. What's interesting, that word that Jesus uses there for way in the Greek is a Greek word, odos. It just means path, way, or street. When I lived in Greece, I lived on odos demokratias. That means street of democracy. And if you wanted to come to my house, you could say, I don't like that, are those? I don't like that path. I don't like that street. Well, then you're not going to get to my house because I live on Democracy Street. And Jesus says, if you want to get to my father's house, he lives on Jesus Street. You take me. I'm the street. I'm the path to the father's house. You can't take any other path. If you take the path marked Buddha, you're not going to get there. And if you take the path marked Muhammad, you're not going to get there. You're not going to get there unless you take the path marked Jesus. Jesus says, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. A journey of a thousand miles Begins with a single step, but it has to be the right step. you got to be on the right path. And if that first step is not based on the truth, you're not going to end up at the Father's house. Notice what the Apostle John says in that postcard size little letter, 3 John, in verse 4. 3 John, we call it chapter 1, but it only has one chapter. So 3 John 1, 4, he says, I have no greater joy than this. To hear of my children walking in the truth. That's the path. Walking in the truth. Real Christianity means you're walking in the truth. You believe. And then you act like Jesus. Now, 
Now, I've read perhaps dozens of commentaries on Ephesians chapter 6, the spiritual armor. I did my master's thesis on this passage, working on spiritual warfare. So I read all these commentaries, and I've listened to numerous sermons, and there's something I always look for because it's almost always missing. People would describe the armor, what they thought it was, you know, the belt of truth and what it is, but they wouldn't tell me practically how to put it on. They say, don't leave without your breastplate of righteousness. Don't leave without your shield of faith. I go, okay, I get that, but how do I on a day-to-day do that? What's the practical side? I don't really understand what you're telling me to do. And as I read all these commentaries and listened to all these sermons, I concluded, apparently, no one knows how to do it. (laughs) I go, well, that can't be right. So you've probably heard a sermon, and that pastor did it right, and he told you how, and I'm grateful for that, but I had trouble finding it. So I look at the scriptures and I thought, well, how do we do this? The Bible must tell us how to do it. How do you put it on? Well, here's my suggestion. I've listed a couple of things there in your notes. How do you put this armor on? How do you believe and act like Jesus? Look at your notes. Here's what you do. You listen to, listen to and be guided by the Holy Spirit. You must listen to and be guided by the Holy Spirit. As Jesus was preparing to leave to go to the Father's house, he's telling the disciples he's leaving. That must have been devastating to them. But then he gave them some great news. He said, I'm going to send someone to replace me who's actually going to be better for you. John chapter 16, verse 7. John 16, 7, Jesus says to the disciples, but I tell you the what? Truth. It is to your advantage. It's better for you that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper, referring to the Holy Spirit, shall not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And Jesus says, it's better for you to have the Holy Spirit than to have me here. Verse 13, but when he... The spirit of truth comes. He will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will disclose to you what is to come. Why is it to their advantage to have the Holy Spirit over Jesus? Because Jesus, in his physical human form, could only be one place at a time. When he was in Israel, he wasn't in any other part of the world. When he was at the Sea of Galilee, he was not in any other place in Israel. In his human form, Jesus can only be one place at a time, and right now he is in heaven. Now, in his deity, he's everywhere, of course. But in his human form, he's one place at a time. And he says, I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit who's not constrained by the human form, and he can be inside and with every single disciple and every single believer, and that's better for you. And he is the spirit of truth, and he will lead you into truth. And so if you want to live by the truth and follow the truth, you need to be indwelt and filled and guided by the Holy Spirit. And we use the acronym D-A-Y, desire, ask, yield, day, every day. Make sure you desire to be filled. Ask the Holy Spirit to fill you and lead you and yield to his leading in your life. Notice how Paul puts it in Romans chapter 8, verse 14. Romans 8, 14, he says, for all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are sons or children of God. The Holy Spirit is leading. Are you following? So how do you put on this belt of truth? How do you believe and act like Jesus? You listen to and you let yourself be guided by the Holy Spirit in your life. But there's more. There's a second thing you can do in order to put on this belt of truth. The second thing is this. Read, absorb, and follow God's Word. Read, absorb, and follow God's Word. Jesus, speaking of God's Word, tells us this in in John 17, 17. In John 17, 17, Jesus says, Praying for his disciples, he says, sanctify them in the truth. Thy word is truth. Sanctify means to be set apart. 
And Jesus is saying, I want my disciples to be set apart toward the truth, away from the devil's lies. And what is truth? The truth is the word of God. And so we're told that the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. We're told that God's written word is truth. So you need both the Holy Spirit and the word of God in your life in order to believe and act like Jesus, in order to put this belt of truth on. Notice how the Apostle James says it in James chapter 1, verses 22 to 25. James chapter 1, verse 22. But prove yourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. In other words, it's not enough to read God's word. You need to heed God's word. It's not enough to know it. You have to show it. Verse 23. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. In other words, you look in the mirror and you go, I need to wash my face or I need to shave or I need to comb my hair or I need to do something else. Because, and, and you look at it and then you just walk away and you don't do any of that stuff. He said, it's not enough to read God's word. You have to absorb it into your life. You have to follow it. Verse 25, but one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, in other words, God's word, and abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this man or woman shall be blessed in what he or she does. You see, it's not a matter of how many sermons you listen to or how many podcasts you listen to or how many chapters of the Bible you you read every day. It's a matter of how much of that is in you and changes the way you live. Might I suggest that before you check your text messages in the morning or your emails or the headlines that you open your Bible and you say, well, I don't have time. Well, read one verse. It's better for you to read one verse and meditate on it all day than read three chapters and forget about them as soon as you close your Bible. It's not how much of the Bible that you get through. It's how much of the Bible gets through you. So read it, absorb it, and follow it. In 1994, the general secretary of the Bible Society in Zimbabwe, a man by the name of Gaylord Gambarami, traveled to a a village named Marawa. And he went there in order to distribute copies of the New Testament. And so that the people would value them, he would sell them for a small price. And he approached one man. He goes, oh, no way am I going to buy a Bible from you. I think the Bible pollutes people. And so Gaylord, this secretary of the Bible Society, said, well, what if I give you a Bible? Will you read it? And the man said, if you give me a Bible, I'm going to tear the pages out and make cigarettes out of it and smoke the Bible. So Gaylord said to him, well, I'll make a deal with you. If you promise to read that page before you smoke it, I'll give you a Bible. And the man agreed. Fast forward two years later, Gaylord is speaking to a group of people back in the same village, big tent, a lot of people there. He's telling them about how valuable the Bible is and how it can change lives. When a man raises his hand and interrupts and said, you don't remember me, but two years ago I was a drunkard and you gave me a Bible to read. And I kept my promise to read every page before I smoked it. And the man said, and I quote, so I smoked my way through Matthew. (laughs) And I smoked the whole of Mark too. Then I smoked Luke. I started smoking John. But when I came to John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. When I, when I read that, a light shone in my heart. I came to know Jesus, and now I'm a church goer. I have seen the light. God's word is truth, and it will change you if you read it, if you absorb it into your life. And if you follow it. So there it is, our first piece of armor, the belt of truth. I would summarize it as it means to believe and act like Jesus. And how do you put it on? 
Well, you need to listen to and be guided by the Holy Spirit. You need to read, absorb, and follow God's Word. Next week, we'll talk about the breastplate. Would you pray with me? I invite you to bow your heads, even if you're watching online, so you can have a private moment. Let's pray together. Are you following the truth? Have you asked Jesus Christ to come into your life? That's the first step in following the truth. Have you believed in him as your Savior? If you haven't, I urge you to do that right now. If you believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins, and that he conquered death and rose from the grave. If it's your desire for him to come into your life and cleanse you from your sins and grant you eternal life, in your heart, you could tell him something like this, Lord Jesus, I believe what you've done for me. Thank you. Come into my life and save me. Lord, help me to follow you. Lord Jesus, as Christians, we thank you that you have given us the truth. We pray, Lord, that you'd help us today, tomorrow, each day that follows, to follow your truth, to be filled with your spirit, to have time in your word, to listen to you. Lord, help us to spread your truth. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.